80% of people, okay, that get the results, that reach their goal, end up giving it all back. 80% of them. If they're in love with just the goal. The 20% yes. of them that figure out have something all in common. This is it right yes. here. Yes, it's the journey. This is the, this is the piece is they, they've learned to make that switch or else it's almost inevitable that you're eventually going to give it back. You're going to put the weight back on. You're going to lose the strength. Those things are going to happen if that's all you are focused on. The people that are successful in this, they have figured out, and maybe they haven't figured out to attach it to all these things we're talking about. They've learned to latch on to other aspects other than their belly fat or their muscle strength or their PR inside the gym. They've learned to attach it to other aspects that enhances their life, and that's what keeps them going on and staying out of the 80% that go back. Hey, real quick, look, stay tuned because next we're going to talk about how exercise makes you age slower helps you with body acceptance, and gives you a better sex life. But before we go there, I'm going to give away a free program. I'm going to give away Maps Anywhere to one of you viewers. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. Do all those things, and then we'll notify you. If we like your comment, we'll notify you if you win free access to Maps Anywhere. One more thing. We have 72 hours left for our big Maps sale. We have Maps Prime, Maps Prime Pro, and Maps Anywhere all bundled together. Retail for $361. We're bringing the price down to $99.99. That's it. One-time payment. Get all those programs. 72 hours left. So if you're interested, go to mapsapril.com. All right, here comes the show. Everybody knows that exercise makes you look good, but here's some surprising benefits of exercise. It's good for your brain. It improves your relationship with pain. Makes you happier, makes you age slower, it helps you recover faster from major illnesses, it improves your sex life, and it teaches you acceptance. By the way, these are all backed by studies. All right, let's start. With are all the first those backed one. by studies? All of them. Really? Every, every single one. What, is what was the first one again? Well, let's start with the first one, right? Which, and here's a big problem. Um, as people age, what, one of the big problems with aging is that people's cognitive ability starts to decline. You know, things like dementia and Alzheimer's. Yeah are becoming a big issue, especially now that we have such a large aging population. And, you know, other parts of the world, their aging population, people that would have higher risk of this, are actually the largest segment of the population. In America, it's it's pretty big, but not the largest. Nonetheless, it's expensive, and our treatments for it really don't work. Like, if you've ever watched somebody suffer from cognitive decline, there's not much you can do uh, medically-wise, and it's it really, really accelerates if you're not moving and... and consciously being active with uh, learning new skills and, and really training your brain to um, stay sharp. Yeah. You know, if you don't use it, you lose it. Yeah, yeah, true. And you know, it's funny. We don't think of the, it's, this is interesting because it's obvious, but we don't think of the brain as being part of the body, right? So when we talk about improving health through exercise. Right. We think, oh, the heart, the joints, the muscles, like the brain is a physical part of the body and improving the health of your <laughs> Which body. Which is includes. kind of ironic considering it's like the main hub. It, exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. You know what really led me down to this point or what got me to read a lot about this point was when I was writing um, The Resistance Training Revolution, I came across a study. This was out of Sydney, Australia, that showed that resistance training um, was the only non-medical intervention that's been shown to stop. And by the way, at the end of the study, it started to reverse but stop the progression of the beta amyloid plaques that we know is a big plays a big role in Alzheimer's. Up until now, there's nothing that we've seen that has really done that. Um, and and besides exercise, exercise actually, and again in studies, has been shown these 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 progression of these beta amyloid plaques is part of what causes Alzheimer's or the symptoms of Alzheimer's, and it's the only thing that stops it. And again, like I said in the study that I read. It, it was trending like it was going to start to reverse. Now, is, is that something that has been proven or is that a correlation that we've noticed that as this plaque builds up, we also notice a decline in cognitive function or people tend to, if they have a lot of this in their brain, also not have great memory? Like, as have of, we proven it? As of right now, that's the target for treatment because okay. we know that the beta amyloid plaques are what causes the Alzheimer's symptoms. So if we look at medications and, and you know research chemicals and drugs, that's the target. How do we prevent these plaques from building up? Um, and again, exercise is the only thing that's been shown to do that. There's, there's a few theories as to why. One of them is, you know, researchers, some researchers will refer to Alzheimer's or dementia as type 3 diabetes. I was going to say, yeah, type 3 diabetes, they started to classify that as. And that is that 
uh, just due to uh, the influx of constant glucose that we're um, consuming? It's the insulin resistance. Insulin resistance. Yeah, because uh, so when you, when you have someone who's like dementia or Alzheimer's and you have them eat a ketogenic diet, you see this kind of temporary improvement in cognitive ability or this improvement in cognitive ability. And it's because they're not running off of glucose, but rather ketones. So whatever systems uh, that use glucose for energy, as they start to become defunct, it's like we move from one type of energy to another, and then we start solving some of that problem. Now, it's not a solution. It's kind of like a detour, right, to help. Um, but what exercise does, especially when you build muscle, is you improve insulin uh, sensitivity. In fact, building muscle is one of the most effective ways to do this. There's studies on obese people where they have them build muscle and don't lose any weight. So they just mm -hmm. have them gain a little bit of muscle. And we see these significant improvements in insulin sensitivity. And that's because muscle is really insulin sensitive itself. It also helps store glycogen, which comes from uh, you know sugars and carbohydrates. So you have now more storage area for this kind of stuff. So that's one of the reasons. It also improves. So we know when you work out, like what do you feel in your biceps when you do curls, right? You get a pump. You get more blood flow. You know what else gets more blood flow? Your brain. Yeah. Mm, brain it's like pumps. A, it's like a brain pump. When people are working out, we see this, imp this increase in blood flow. So to, to, to broadly say working out like that, um, th that's such a wide spectrum of what somebody would define training or working yeah. out. And so does does the research go into like how, how minimal, because I'd always rather go there first. Like what's the least amount of yeah. work that I'd have to do training wise in order to help prevent this? Uh, or, or does that mean uh, I have to do five days of an hour work consistently in order to get these benefits? What does that look like? There's a dose dependent bell curve, meaning uh, some is better than nothing. So 10 minutes a day, you'll see some improvement. 30 minutes a day, you'll see more of an improvement. And then there's a peak where you'll see maximum improvement. And then it starts to decline with overtraining and overwork. Now, I don't know off the top of my head what those numbers look like as a trainer, you know, obviously somebody who's worked with a lot of people for long periods of time. I mean, we could give a general answer, but I know that this would be very individual. Right? Well, yeah, I would imagine too, just based off of like your family's history and genetics and any kind of epigenetic factor there, like you'd be even more motivated if there's like dementia in your family, you know, Alzheimer's to make sure that you're doing everything you can to you know, preventatively, uh, you know, going into age. Uh, so that way, you, you know, you're, 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 you're better equipped down the road. Yeah. But I asked that question for that exact reason, Justin, because I would be my one concern as a trainer, as a coach, I would think that, um, I, I wouldn't want, if it was a client of mine who has, uh, you know, potentially the epigenetics that could send them this direction. Right. Right. Uh, I also wouldn't want them to overtrain thinking that more is better. Yeah. Mm. Right. So, and so I, the individual part that I think is so important is that, um, yeah, you know, if, if some is good, more isn't necessarily that's better. That's right. Yeah. Right. So, because, and, and what you'd have to factor in with this person, yes, the genetic component, obviously. So if they already have a propensity for it, then we want to be trying to be stay ahead of it, but also recognizing it. Does this person have a very stressful life as it is? How is their sleep already? Good, good point. How is their diet already? And, and what's uh, their fitness level? Right. And what's their fitness level? It's like, I, again, I'm always going to go back to my, I'm always looking to do the least amount of work to elicit the most amount of change or, or benefit in this case. So what's the little bit of little bit of work that I can add into this person's life to start heading the right yeah. direction on the, the bell curve, but not think that, oh, just, oh, I don't want to get it. Not be an alarmist about it. Yes. Be sensible about your right. approach. Yeah. yeah. Well, so far, based off of the, the studies, it seems like, and there's not a lot of studies on strength training and health in general, just mainly because over the last, it's only really been over the last 15 years where we've looked at strength training and health. And what we're finding is it's not only incredible for health, but in many cases superior to other forms of exercise. But based on the current research, it seems like strength training is the best form of exercise for cognition, probably because the insulin sensitizing effects, there's the proprioceptive effects, right? When I'm doing like all these different exercises with dumbbells and barbells and machines in my body, there's lots of, I have to really focus on my mood. It's not repetitive like running where I'm just doing the same thing over, over again. I have to balance. I'm pressing this way. I'm pressing that way or I'm rowing or I'm rotating. So there's, it's using my brain. Yeah. a little bit differently. There's um, more neural connections there. Happening. Yes, but all forms of exercise have shown this benefit. Uh, but again, you're right. It has to be the right dose because exercising for maximum performance is not the same as exercising for longevity. That's right. You know, because you'll look at like high performing athletes don't have a longer, you know, lifespan Shelf than the average life, person. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so you're right. You have to train appropriately. It's not like, you know, 
hammering yourself day in and day out. And studies do show that that actually is terrible for your health is beating yourself up. Right. And so I, what I think about is like, okay, somebody who is in this position where they have the, the genes, um, you know, putting them on a very restrictive diet and training five to seven days a week, you know, strength training. And then in addition to that also doing cardio yeah. is like probably m way more, not only than enough, but then potentially heading down the, the back, ha back part of the, the bell curve. And yeah. so, I, I mean, I think I would caution my client and just be like, listen, our, our goal isn't, this isn't to be shredded or to be super buff. Like the goal is for health and to prevent that. So the way we would train, I think would be, would be different. Yeah. Both training and diet, I think would be more a balanced approach. Now here's what else is interesting with exercise is that it increases something called brain derived neurotropic factor, right? BDNF, which is like miracle grow for the brain. So like when your brain receives more of this protein. Um, your neurons are healthier. Your brain is less inflamed. I wrote some notes down uh, because I actually looked this up and I thought it was very fascinating. So BDNF production and neuroplasticity, which is induced by exercise. So neuroplasticity is your, your brain's ability to adapt. So just like your muscles, your brain can change and adapt like a muscle can. So this has been known to delay Alzheimer's, Huntington's disease, it improves cognitive functioning overall, especially for older adults. And here's where researchers think why this happens. Like, is it making your body make more BD BDNF? Is that what's happening? Or, or is more it more efficient? Or is it or is it using it more effectively? Like what's yeah. going on? Here's what they think. This is the leading hypothesis. They think that exercise releases chemicals that prevent the inhibition of BDNF. So mm -hmm. there are chemicals that will go up that will prevent the inhibition of BDNF. So in other words, so it's like, like an adaptogen almost. It remove it removes the break, right? Yeah. So like your body will produce so much BDNF. It's the governing there. Yes, and when you exercise, that limit is raised. So now you produce more uh, as a result of the exercise. Oh, uh, interesting. Yeah, really, really cool. And I, now I trained lots of people over the age of sixty five. At, at one point, this was like a majority of my clients, and the the brain effects they would comment on. They would come up and tell me. I yeah. feel sharper. Memory recall, yeah. sharpness, focus. It's just, yeah, there's a lot of factors there. Uh, because like you said, it's it's connected to your body. I think we just we just don't give that enough weight that uh, all the systems are affected by exercise in a positive way. Okay, so that's your first one. What's your what's your next one? The second one was it improves your relationship to pain. Now, this is a really interesting one. So I've told this story before, but I remember the first time I trained a client and I observed this. I was training this woman. She'd never done really any exercise before besides walking. She wasn't an athlete ever, total newbie, um, deconditioned, right? Typical deconditioned person. And we were doing uh, tricep press downs and we had the rope and I had like no weight on the stack. I'm just getting her the form and she starts doing reps and then she suddenly let go of the rope and slams down the, you know, there was no weight on the stack luckily, but it's like, Dish. I'm like, what happened? She's like, I, I, I hurt. I, I think I hurt myself. She felt like, a burn for the first time. She never felt that kind of pain before. Yeah. And I thought to myself, like, how strange. But it makes sense. If you've never felt that before, you probably think, what's going on? That's an extreme example. But it did make me think a little deeper about this and that, you know, I, I've been working out now consistently for a long, I don't know, almost 30 years, okay? And I feel no less pain when I exercise than a beginner. If anything, I feel more pain because I, I can push myself harder. The beginner, that pain, it turns them off. I'm scared of it. Oh my God, it's, it's, it's not tolerable. To me, because I have a relationship with that pain that's different, I, I actually enjoy it. I like the way a heavy set feels or a burn or how my muscles feel while I'm working out because I've associated with the results and how I feel. And so now what it's done is it's changed the re my relationship to pain. Now, why is this important? Pain is super, super complicated. If you talk to yeah. anybody that treats pain, like talk to a doctor, a pain specialist, and they'll tell you it's one of the hardest things to deal with because pain can be physical. It could also be emotional. It could also be your, your perception. Um, you know, antidepressants can make people's back pain go away sometimes. If you're sad, you feel more pain. If you're happy, you feel less pain. There's people who get MRIs, you know, you know, on their back and they feel like they've got tremendous, like, oh my God, my spine or what? And they look and they're like, everything looks fine. I've had clients like that. Everything looks fine. And they're like, but I have so much pain. There was a study done on, this one was really weird, on knee surgery where they mm. took a bunch of people. I don't know how the hell they got people to sign up for this, <laughs> but they did half 
the people, they just cut them and sewed them back up. Oh, yeah. And the other this half, they actually- a messed up study. I know. Yeah. The other half, they actually did the surgery. So one half, they just incision, sewed them back up. So the person thought they had the surgery. Similar reductions in knee pain from yeah. the people that thought they had it versus the people that did. Percentage mind, wise, right? Yes. It was an even split, wasn't it? It was. And it, it's, it just, oh. and now this doesn't mean that knee surgery is a waste of time. I think what it shows is how complicated yeah. pain is. So changing your relationship to pain through exercise, which is controlled, I think is super valuable. Yeah, I didn't really consider that um, it, that workout, working out and exercise really provided that. Um, it just just trying to improve strength and and you know build my build myself um, to be a better athlete was really my focus. But you know, taking all those lessons you learn along the way um, and really being able to decipher what type of pain it was yes, uh, is, is yeah, really interesting because I like, like your experience with your client, not really understanding what that was initially because she's never been exposed to that before. There's been a lot of instances that I've had to describe even with young athletes that I'm coaching that, you know, that's muscular, that's nerve. Oh, that's true with that's, your coaching. Yeah. That's joint pain. That's, yes. you know, and they they haven't had enough experience yet to really understand how to decipher whether or not it's serious or it's something that you know is going to work itself out. Well, if this is true, the opposite is also true then, which you have people with the opposite type of relationship with pain. You oh. have you have one extreme, which you have talked about right now, which is the client is like, oh my god, what is this? Yeah. Scared of it? They don't they 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 don't like it. It's uncomfortable, and so they avoid it. And then you have the other end of the spectrum of people that chase that, that are punishing themselves, that mm. you know feel like they need to feel pain or need oh, to feel, feel yeah. this this feeling of what we would consider overtraining, or, or else they don't feel like they did enough or they did what they were supposed to. So it's really interesting when you think about that. Like if that is true, that that you know what that exercise can really change the relationship with 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 pain. Well, it can also work the other way. Actually, I'll, I'll say this. I don't think it's two ends of the, of the spectrum. I think it's the same side of the spectrum. It's unawareness on both. It's, all, it's still unawareness, sure. right? So somebody who's so focused on their insecurity. Yeah, the spectrum, the body, what I mean is how they perceive it. Yes, yes. Right. It's, it's same it's, thing. Though. They're just, they're literally ignoring it. Right. They, they, their relationship to pain still isn't good. If you Now, here's the thing. If you follow, and I want to say this, this is also true. If you exercise long enough, you'll learn all these things or you'll figure these things out, right? So you may ignore pain when you first start because you're so insecure. I want to lose weight. I don't care. I hate my body, whatever. Do it for 10 years. At some point, you figure out like this this isn't working and I have to become more aware and really develop a different relationship. Well, I think there's a there's a, a large portion of people that chase it. I think I'm guilty of this at one point in my in my career. Oh, I was um, too. I, I, I think I, I believe that I had to feel mm -hmm. super sore in order to, uh, you know, for me to get great results. And the, the opposite is true. So I think there's, and then there's these, I mean, we've all had these clients, right? I, I remember having clients where, I'd catch them in on a day that they weren't supposed to be training or an off day and they'd be in the gym and I'd see them over in the corner and they're just balls to the wall in yeah. the cardio machine. And I, well, what are you doing? Oh, yesterday I went out and had wine and did it. And they, and they, I cheated on my diet. Yes. So they're in here starving their body and then punishing themselves. Self-flagellation. Yes. yes. I say flagellation. Yeah. yeah and, and, and meanwhile, you know, thinking that they, they're they're doing the right thing or they feel good about it because it's like, you know, I didn't just do nothing about it. I, I yeah. made a mistake and then I'm back in here and I'm burning it off. And mm -hmm. so that's uh, equally an unhealthy relationship yes. with pain too. Yes, yes. I think, but if you do it long enough, right, you have to figure this out, right? But, it, but it, it provides you the opportunity to decipher between, you know, good pain and bad pain. Like I know pretty well because of exercise and I know you guys too, if you f feel pain, can you guys tell right away, that's good. That's bad. Yeah. Like yeah. right away. Right. Like, Oh my back. Imagine this, you work out real hard and your back hurts, but it's not bad pain. It hurts because you overtrain. So it's just super sore versus mm -hmm. I hurt it. You guys can decipher it immediately. Right. Yeah, yeah. Lots of people. Have you ever had a client come to you after early on and they're like really sore yeah. and they think they injured themselves <laughs> yeah, they and they can't move think you right? hurt because they're so tight <laughs> and yes. stiff, but yeah, they're, they're just sore. I had my kids do that. So I, I remember the first time I trained my daughter when she was young and you know, it's hard to judge how hard to train someone at first. And I thought I was appropriate, but uh, apparently we went a little too hard. And the next morning she wakes up and she's calling me from bed. Oh, bah, bah, and I go in there. What's the matter, honey? She's like, 
I, 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 I hurt my legs while I was working out. And so I'm like, what do you mean you hurt your legs? Where does it hurt? She's like, oh, right here. So I like got her knee and I stretched it. I said, does this feel, and I had to move her through and to figure out for her, like, okay, you're just sore. Yeah. This isn't that kind of, you know, the kind of bad pain. I have some notes here from another article. By the way, these will all be posted in the show notes, but check this out. So this is from a, uh, a website where they're talking about like the complexity of pain or whatever. And then they talked about exercise and they said, exercise is a proven intervention for treating pain regardless of its mechanism. Okay. In fact, it's the only intervention shown to be effective for all pain mechanisms. So it decreases nociceptor activity, okay? So nociceptors can perceive pain from a physical standpoint. It increases inhibitory systems. So inhibitory systems are systems that will promote painkillers. It increases endogenous opioids. So your body's own production of opioids, which makes you feel good. So exercise does that too. Of course, it alters serotonin levels and it restores normal movements to joints. So if your pain is a result of poor movement patterns, proper exercise makes you move more, that goes away as well. It impacts not only biological pain mechanisms, but also the contextual factors of the movement system and psychosocial mechanisms. In other words, all of the things that we've identified that contribute to the complexity of pain or pain itself, exercise improves all of them. Yeah. There isn't a single treatment that does that. I mean, I always bring up isometrics, but it has an analgesic effect. Totally. Which is amazing. But yeah, there's just so much benefit there that uh, is untapped if you're not doing 100%. it. 100%. All right. The next one is it, it makes you happier. You know, I read a study, so trip off this, right? I read a study that talked about the life quality effects of antidepressants on people with mild to moderate depression, which is the most common form, okay? And so these are people who took uh, SSRIs and so selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, I think, this is the com most common antidepressants. And here's what they found. Although all of the participants said they felt less symptoms of depression, they saw no improvements in quality of life wow. compared to controls. Now, there's a bigger discussion here, I think, is in the complexity of what improves quality of life, what happiness really is. Is it just a feeling or is it is there meaning and purpose? And you know, we so didn't the SSRIs pretty much dull that uh, feeling. So to, to where you're you're not feeling depressed, but you're not really improving your feelings. That's that's what this is leading to. That's what it hints to, right? So what they'll do, like an SSRI, what it does is it prevents the reuptake of serotonin. So you get more circulating serotonin. So you get the feeling or less of a feeling of depression, but the quality of life in these people didn't really improve compared to people who didn't take it. Now, exercise is different. Mm -hmm. Exercise, first off, in comparisons to SSRI drugs for mild to moderate depression is at least as effective at reducing the feelings of depression. Now, when you follow the studies long, it actually starts to trend better than SSRIs. Now, yeah. here's another thing. Exercise definitely improves quality of life. Definitely. Why? Because it, it doesn't just make you feel better, but because it also provides all these lessons and growth and struggle and empowerment. Yeah. That's my opinion, at least in terms well, of how pretty much everything we're going to list off in this episode is on top of that, you know, yes. besides the fact that uh, it helps with uh, the depression angle. Well, without talking about antidepressants, what about just in general? Uh, what is the, you know, kind of the curve look like for the average human? Like, do they get happier? Isn't there like a peak and then you come down? I think that's what Arthur- Oh, Brooks as we age? Yeah, I think that there's a conversation in that in itself is that we we get to a certain point where we see kind of peak happiness and then it starts to decline. And a lot of, uh, there's a, and they've obviously, they've uh, pointed in the direction of things of just like losing purpose or whatever yeah. like that in their life. And so um, besides just talking about de depression and antidepressant drugs and, and what all the studies around that, but what about just just the average person who just tends to get less happy as they get older. And yet they probably have more things. And we've also seen that over uh, time too, is like, we have more today, right? Somebody, somebody who would be considered in poverty today has more than like, you know, somebody who'd be considered wealthy a hundred years ago has yet we're less happy as a society. Yeah. So what is, what does that tell you? And then what does exercise provide uh, That's special, people. right? Think about that, right? I bet you, if I gave, if we created a pill that gave you all the physical mm -hmm. benefits of exercise, it would still wouldn't equal the benefits of exercise. I actually think we'd have more depressed people. So do I. It's just like what I think. I mean, uh, I agree. so then that Elon Musk interview that just he just recently did. Uh, he he says that we're that there's a lot of experts that are calling this this era that's coming up is the era of abundance. It should be possible to imagine 
a bunch of goods and services that can't profitably be made now, but could be made in that, sure. in that world, courtesy of, of legions of robots. Um, yeah, um, it, it will be a world of abundance. The only scarcity that will exist in the future is that which we decide to create ourselves as humans. Mm. And really soon here, well, especially with AI coming and this, all yeah. this technology and, and stuff that, and, and I remember, I'll never forget the first time we met and hung out with Tom Bilyeu. He said this and it stuck with me forever when he said that anything that can be free will be free yeah. in our lifetime. And so, you know, what does that mean? Is Well, it means if we can create something where like a an, an AI robot can now replace a human from creating or making of it, literally the overhead becomes very, very minimal. Mm -hmm. So people who could not afford a lot of these things will now be able to afford these things. But the thing that I think is most scary about that is that I predict that we won't be any happier no. as a society. In fact, I actually think we'll have the opposite that will happen. Even though more people will be in abundance, more people will have, I actually think as a whole, we will well, start to- Studies actually support that. The studies yeah. show that up to a certain point, having more helps. So like if you don't have a home, it helps to have a home. If you don't have food, it helps to have food, right? If you don't have water, it helps to have water. But past a certain point- you don't get any happier with more stuff. And I th I agree with you because I think what will yeah. happen is people are going to be so lost. I have everything. I take these pills that make me feel a particular way. I have as much sex as I want because I have a sex robot or whatever. I don't have to work. That means I could like paint and, and do art all day long or read or do nothing all day long. Like, but well, I have all this food. Yeah, like, we're eliminating the opportunity to struggle. Yes. Struggle is a, a major component in there that provides purpose. Yeah. Um, and, and what does exercise include? Exercise, lots of struggle. Lots of struggle. It's, it's, it's basically the, the microcosm for, you know, the, the grander scale of what life, uh, you know, you're living. Uh, so this is something that's controllable. You see growth in there. And then growth is also that other factor um, that, you know, is we're, we're growth and we're growth, um, junkies at heart. Like uh, people want to grow and to, to evolve and, um, to have purpose. And, and once we start like pulling those opportunities away, that's where I really see the decline. We're, 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 we're always doing one or the other. We are either growing or we're dying. Mm. And so, and when you are in the pursuit of bettering your health, you're in, you're moving in the direction it's growth. of growth. Totally. A little bit more muscle, a little bit smarter and sharper, a little bit leaner, you know, a little bit stronger, a little bit more mobility. That's more the, health, better the, health. Yeah, yeah. Th these are all things in the, the growth direction. And so by completely deciding that, oh, I'm not going to be a, a workout or a fitness or a health person and just cutting that out of your life, you automatically are, I mean, that's like a, a layup for growth. I mean, there's other aspects of your life where you can grow, but that's like, there's so many aspects within trying to be healthier that provide that that growing or that growth for you. And if you're not, you're going the other direction. Oh, I tell you what, you take somebody who uh, struggled, learned, built a business and earned $100 million versus someone who won the lottery and won $100 million. And I, you will see a stark difference in the value and purpose be behind both people. Very, very different. And studies have shown this. People who win the lottery tend to lose it afterwards and they're right back to where their baseline was before versus when you struggle and grow and learn. So you take the struggle out of exercise, the growth process out of exercise, and you just get the results. You're not going to get, you know what you'll end up with? An antidepressant pill. That's what you're going to end up with. Because we know that exercise, proper exercise increases serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, all the chemicals that make us feel good. But if you remove the work that goes along with exercise, then you're just left with another antidepressant pill. Here's some more interesting stuff on this, on the on, on happiness in the brain uh, and exercise. So I, this is another great article. This is from Harvard, uh, from Harvard Health. In people who are depressed, neuroscientists have noticed that the hippocampus of the brain, the region that helps regulate mood, is smaller. Exercise supports nerve cell growth in the hippocampus, improving nerve cell connections, which help relieve depression. So mm. you think exercise just builds your biceps. It also builds your hippocampus. Nerve gains. How cool is that, right? <laughs> yeah. All right, like here's it. another one, right? Um, it actually, exercise actually makes you age slower. By, uh, like, like on a chemical, biological level, you have an age. You also have a chronological, chronological age. So you could be 50, but then we can look at your cells and say, how old are they uh, biologically? And then we can determine an age there. Exercise actually 
slows that process down. So you guys are familiar with the telomeres that we yes. always talk about, right? You like, find like these. The length is is what we're looking at of the telomeres. Yes. So we're looking at the length. Longer telomeres, typically younger, shorter, typically older. Proper exercise is one of the most, if not the most effective way that we found to maintain long telomeres. So it's like you get older chronologically, but your cells stay young because of exercise. And I tell you what, like I'm going to ask you guys this question. When you guys see people who work out consistently and do it right, how big of a difference is it between that person and their peers as they age? Oh, yeah. It just keeps growing. As, it's as crazy. They, yeah. Isn't there a simpler way to say that? Like our, our bodies are always adapting in one way or the other. Either is adapting and it's pruning off things that we no longer need or use because it's trying to become more efficient as we age, right? Or just like, adapting to what you like. If you don't do anything, well, then this is what we need. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. It's it's pruning off things, everything from in your, your cognitive side to your muscles. It's like, hey, if we're never going to move in that range of motion again, we're going to lose that range of motion. Yep. So you're either, you're always adapting. You're either adapting in that direction where you're pruning off and losing skills and abilities, or you're adapting in the direction of gaining new skills and yep. abilities. Yep. And so by sim just simply by exercising or training, right? You are trying to in build muscle, increase range of motion, or keep those things so the body is adapting in a direction of growth, of improvement. Yep. Simply not doing that, it's naturally going to adapt in the opposite direction and start pruning all these things. Yeah, I hate to always use the example with the car, but like there's just so many parallels there that I see all the time, mechanically speaking. You know, even with cells, like they need to, you know, optimally um, be used and and constantly have work. Whereas, like an engine in a car, like it, you know that if you're not constantly running through all the systems and getting the oil flowing, getting the gas yeah. through it, getting everything working and moving, you know, there's just it, it just slowly dies. It rusts out. There's like opportunities for disease basically to come in. It's you know we're we're built to move. So mechanically speaking, we are machines in that sense uh you know you can look at us biologically but we're still totally. have a lot of mechanisms in there to consider totally you know managing gyms it was it's really interesting this is like you start to notice this it's well i mean it becomes uh impossible not to notice a 25 year old guy who works out and is dedicated and eats right the difference between a 25 year old that works out like that and one that doesn't is that the 25 year old that works out can bench press 300 pounds could squat 350 pounds, has got more muscle and leaner. And his cope is is the person we're comparing him to, another 25-year-old, can't do those things. That's the difference, right? He could bench 300. This guy can maybe bench 120. That's the difference. Take a 70-year-old that exercises regularly, that eats right, that's been doing it for years, and compare them to their, their counterpart. The difference is they're independent. They can walk up the stairs. They can take care of themselves. This person is in a care home, has chronic diseases, is on 15 different medications and can't stay, you know, can't take care of themselves. Like stark difference, dramatic difference. It makes a huge difference as you age to stay fit. And it's because it slows, it literally slows down the biological aging process so that you don't get the same chronic diseases. You continue to stay mobile. You're sharp. You have sex. You can do all this other stuff, and your and the people, your peers, are like dying, and they need help. It's really crazy. I feel like it's um. You ever seen those those charts or graphs for like the stock market or a Roth IRA, where it's like if you start at this age and you do, every year you put away two thousand, if you start at this age versus this, oh age, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, compound, yeah, the uh, compounding interest. I yeah. really feel like the same thing is with exercise. Totally. It's like and as as you age, that gap between you and the people that weren't investing becomes massive. At the beginning, it's only two thousand dollars a year. Yeah, you know what's two thousand dollars a year? Good point. But when you're 50, 60, 70, and you've Millions. consistently have done that, you <laughs> are now a millionaire in compared to your peers who chose, eh, it's not a big deal. I'll wait till I have to do it or I'm not going to do it at all. I mean, I think that's where it reminds me of that, right? It has a very, totally. very, very similar separation totally. as you get older. This next one is pretty cool because this was a big uh, U-turn from the medical industry. It used to be not that long ago where if you had a major chronic disease, the advice from your doctor was to not exercise, don't move too much. Right. Like we don't want to stress don't your put body. More stress on your body. What we're finding now is that exercise uh improves uh or helps you recover from major illnesses to the point now where it's protocol or if you have protocol. Heart disease, let me uh, let me read this one to you. Regular exercise improves your heart health and studies have shown that that it's tolerated well in people with heart disease and produces 
significant benefits. In other words, if you exercise properly when you have heart disease, forget about preventing it. Obviously, it prevents chronic disease. But let's say you already got heart disease. Exercise uh, helps you recover much better than not, right? Diabetes. Physical activity helps you control your weight, boost your energy, lower, increase your insulin sensitivity, and sometimes uh, reverse diabetes. Asthma. I grew up with asthma as a kid. Resistance training cured it for me. I don't get asthma anymore. And I'm, I'm positive it was exercise that did it for me. Uh, pain, chronic pain. Well, as trainers, uh, that's something that we solve all the time. Arthritis, cancer, cancer. They show, studies show that exercise, it lowers the risk of dying from uh Killer types of cancers, you know, breast cancer, stage four, uh, colon cancers, prostate cancers. So you have cancer if you exercise properly and you do a, you know same treatments as someone else, you're more likely to survive. What, what do you exercise. think the, the biggest rocks uh, from that are? Do you think it is the uh, you know movement of blood and oxygen and nutrients? Do you think it's the uh, you know the metabolism benefits of uh, building the protective muscle? Effects of muscle. Do you think muscle? it's the protective effects of muscle, both for the metabolism and for your bones and mm. like what? What do you think are all, all, all those things the are true to keep you moving, uh, which I know as you age a lot of times, like um, let's say you can't get out of your chair anymore. Like what that does in terms of your overall decline yep, starts right. happening at a really rapid pace. So yep. right. The, the mental, the mental, mental benef benefits of the, having the purpose of it and everything, like, all those things probably help fight chronic disease. Oh, I mean, if, if, if we had, if we invented exercise right now, we would be, we would all win the Nobel peace prize by, by all the benefits that it provides. Uh, it would be insane. There's like almost nothing that it, that it improves. And so if you have a major illness and by the way, this is goes without saying, but I'm gonna say it anyway, just to be very clear, appropriate exercise, yes, the right dose. Okay. The right dose, because if you have chronic disease and then you go overtrain, you're going to kill yourself. You're going to make yourself much worse. If you do it appropriately and apply it appropriately, you're improving your health. Does a healthier version of you have a higher chance of surviving or recovering from chronic disease? Absolutely, right? Across the board, yes. So that's what they show in the studies. And this, again, 50 years ago, if you had heart disease or cancer or a yeah. stroke, doctor was like, don't oh, do anything. Yeah. Sit down, Avoid it at all sleep, costs, right? relax. Now they're like, no, you got to go in the opposite direction. All right, here's another one. It improves your sex life. Okay. Yeah. So, so here's an interesting. Who doesn't one. like that? Benefits. I know. So check this out. I wrote this. I wrote this down from a cool article. So, uh, this was on on exercise and sex. So this is quote right. In men, regular exercise appears to be a natural Viagra. It's associated with a lower risk of erectile problems. In one study, sedentary middle aged men assigned to participate in a vigorous exercise program for nine months reported more frequent sexual activity, improved sexual function, and greater satisfaction. Those whose fitness levels increased most, who, who's increased the most, saw the biggest improvements in their sex lives. Now, with women, women uh, who exercise or physical active report greater sexual desire, arousal, and satisfaction in, compar to, in comparison to women who are sedentary. The uh, blood flow to the genitals, which you know we all think of the erection in a man, uh, women also get you know a mini erection. They're, they get their blood flow goes there as well, and that's a part of their sexual satisfaction and whatnot, exercise dramatically increases that. So it's like you get, you know, you, you increase blood flow to your muscles, you get it to you, your, your genitals too. Do you think there's specific uh, benefits that are unique to each sex? From the exercise? Yeah, for example, like I have some feminine traits, I know that. One of the, <laughs> I know that. I like okay. how you started that. <laughs> so, so I, I recognize that. And I, I, I your nails. I've also recognized that I'm, you, cross your legs. you know, I've been teased before by my own wife saying that like, that's, that's such a girl's trait for you to be like that. Where <laughs> no I, when I, no, I'm serious. When, uh, when I'm training and I'm working out and I feel sexy, oh, I, I want to have more sex yeah. and it's, mm. it's very directly connected to that and when i'm not consistent and i don't feel confident and i just i don't i feel sluggish and i don't i don't look i don't want to have sex. self confidence yeah, yeah. i don't want to i don't want to i just not in the mood as much but boy when i'm it's when better I, when you look good naked i, I mean and it seems obvious right yeah. but i i also th feel like that I, I there's probably more women right now they're listening like oh totally adam you know that totally agree yeah. with that <laughs> and maybe maybe less maybe less dudes yeah my boss is like i don't give a shit if i got yeah. a belly or not i'm still fucking yeah. you know what i'm saying like i'm sure there's guys 
guys that think like that, but I'm totally not that. I I'm, bet you guys do the same thing. I think guys don't admit it. Well, I'm that. asking you yeah. guys, are, do you notice that about yourself? Yeah, totally. it's, it's very obvious for me. If I feel strong and fit and, and just, I feel healthy. Oh yeah, man. I mean, I, by the way, this makes perfect evolutionary sense. If you feel healthy and strong, your body's like procreate. You got what it takes mm. to take care of this kid. Yeah, you can yeah. work, you can move. I mean, you don't feel good. Why would you add another so mouth that, to feed? Uh, right? that the only be... difference is the lights on, lights off for me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that so that there's a there's a point right there. So maybe there are, are some extra benefits for since women are the ones carrying the babies that their body that it's even more important totally. for them to feel health that way because if they are if their health is just slightly off, mm. the likelihood of their body telling it that it wants to reproduce is much greater. We can be we can really hammer the shit out of our bodies and our, our body still will say it wants to reproduce or can and reproduce yeah. but a, a, a woman's hormones if they're off really bad or she's ill or sick i would imagine that really well, shuts that well side speaking off. of hormones right when you're telling your body to build muscle your body has to organize its hormones to do that so the, the first step is send the signal to build muscle one of the one of the next steps is your body says all right hormones let's organize you in a way to build muscle what does that build muscle hormone profile look like it's a youthful hormone profile. Yeah. It's higher testosterone. Elevated testosterone. In both men and women, it's growth hormone levels that are more youthful. It's cortisol that's appropriate, right? So it goes up in the morning, comes down at night. It's estrogen and progesterone balance in women. Um, it's insulin sensitivity. It's a, it's a youthful hormone profile. And of course, when you're more youthful or younger, you tend to have more sex drive uh, because you're more fertile. So you're actually producing a, fer a fertility type hormone profile and that's going to drive you to want to have, or at least especially enjoy your sex. I, just, yeah. I think it also improves the quality of your totally. sex. Um, you know, the, I had a very funny thing that happened to me not that long ago with Katrina. It was not that long ago when I was kind of off of uh, my training consistently. I was still training just for me, the volume, right? So I know I share that all the podcasts, like there's never, I don't ever go a, a month without lifting weights at least once a week, right? But my volume was down. So my my strength, my stamina, all that stuff had been declining. My diet was off. And I remember feeling winded in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like that That's was a good point. That was the reason why we stopped. Was that like I mean, I, I would have loved it to continue on for another 20 or 30 minutes. But you know, I was I was cramping up. I was getting I was I was tired. And so and I know that you had when, to get out of the swing. when I when I feel <laughs> vibrant and strong and I've got a lot of stamina, uh, you know, these hour sessions are more Bro, frequent you, because I can do it. You know, we're laughing. You know, that's funny that when I when when I was organizing this episode, I actually looked that up. That is a major thing. Well, think about okay, I'm I'm a, a 40 year old healthy man. I, imagine being 50 and not healthy. That has to be or, if, I, if I could feel that. Just a little bit of dip in my stamina from training and stuff like that, that it affected mine. How dramatic do you think that is? For if you're obese or yeah. you're just totally yes. out of shape. Yeah, you're just laying down the whole time. That's right. Fun. Because no. you can't, not because you don't want to or you wouldn't love to do it, totally. because you can't yeah. perform for that long. That's so 100%. You got you to gotta make the case that how it dramatically improves the quality of your sex No, life. you're right. Yeah. You're absolutely right. It's funny when, they, when you look at unhealthy older individuals. When they start, when Viagra first first hit the market, so Viagra obviously was a breakthrough drug. It, you know, it, it gave men the ability to have erections when they couldn't have one before. You know, for a long time or whatever, they actually had to warn some of their patients because they were older and out of shape. And they said, "All right, here's a deal. I'm going to give you Viagra," which, by the way, improves blood flow. But still, they had to say, "We got to be careful because you could give yourself a heart attack because you're out of shape." And now you can get a, you know an erection. You're going to go have sex. And you're so out of shape that we think you need to lose weight and get in shape before. This is you. the one area I actually see barbell hip thrusts actually making a difference. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, these are, these are all these are all things that uh, I know. This isn't the the main direction of the episode, but I think an important note because we talk a lot about this on the show about helping clients connect the dots to other aspects of yeah, training totally that dramatically not improve just their fat life. loss yeah. and, and right? how you because there, there's a huge portion of the population right now that don't strength train because they they think that it's for self-absorbed people yeah because yeah. they Meat care heads. so much about the way they look or they or they they want to be strong they have insecurities about not having muscles so there is a big portion of our population that stays away from it because they think that's what I, they look at the fitness space uh -huh. and there are massive benefits that have nothing to do with any of those things that you get from it. And I think it's important that even if your client is somewhat aware is helping them 
connect their journey, their, their, their training, their dieting to these aspects, because if you want it to continue forever and into old age, these are the things that will it continue yeah. to give See how benefits. it affects all these other yeah. areas. You're not going to continue to hit PRs most likely into your 50s, 60s, and 70s. No. Okay. You're most likely not going to be in the best body fat percentage you've ever been in your 50s, 60s, and 70s. But all these things that we're talking about, you absolutely continue to maintain or potentially even improve the, into old age. 100%. The primary, for me personally, the primary driver behind exercise was when I first started build muscle. How strong am I? How do I look? Now, I still like those things, don't get me wrong, but they're not the prime drivers anymore. All the stuff we're talking about, especially the mental health for me, is the main driver. If I had a, a some some problem where I lost tons of muscle and strength and I couldn't really build that anymore with exercise, I'd still work out right. because of the of all those other benefits. So I'm so glad you you made that point. All right, here's the last one. I love this one. And that is that it teaches you acceptance. So people think, well, what do you mean acceptance with exercise? Well, I'm going to tell you something right now. If you stick to exercise long enough, you will learn to accept your physical and genetic limitations. You will. Because you may at first be motivated by your insecurities and by your body image. And you might look at a picture on Instagram and say, I want to look like that person right there. That's the body I want. And then you stick to it long enough. And then at some point you're like, I'm never going to look like that person. I don't have their genetics. I don't have their body structure. They're younger than me, whatever. But I'm going to keep doing this because uh, I enjoy this and it's still giving me benefit. Like that type of acceptance is is phenomenal because it leads you to the next thing, which is that you realize that there are certain things you can control. So let's accept the stuff that we can't. Let's focus on the stuff that we can. Like I get up and work out. Mm -hmm. I can do this exercise. I can challenge myself. I can improve my health personally. I can do the best with the genetics that I was given, with my circumstances. I could I could improve upon them within myself. But that acceptance lesson is is phenomenal. Another part of it is that it takes time. Like do you guys remember learning that? Yeah. When you first worked out? I think that yeah. I think that's a big thing, a part of the acceptance is just understanding that not only that will it take a long time to probably reach certain goals, but that the goals just keep the bar just keeps getting moved. It reminds yeah. me of like chasing a financial number. Like, oh, I want to be a millionaire one day. It's like, well, if you ask any millionaire when they reach a million, what happened? They wanted two million, and yeah, then three, yeah. it's like, so you that will never end. So you so the the quicker you can figure that out, that oh, I have this look. I would just be so happy if I had six pack abs and my arms were two more inches. Or yeah. you have this, and then you reach it, and then what happens is you 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 still want more, yep. and so that acceptance of understanding that these pursuits that they'll they'll continue your entire life. So instead mm -hmm. of being so focused on those pursuits, more so learning to, you know, enjoy the journey yes. and the process. And that's where the real magic is at. Yeah, Absolutely. we have these conversations all the time with clients uh, because initially what pulls them in is a very specific target, a very specific yep. goal. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of times, you know, from there, what's the next thing? You know, what's the next big event I can sign myself up for and achieve something on that level when in fact, we're not paying attention to every workout that we're doing where we're getting all these benefits and we're really enjoying the process of, of getting to that goal. The goal starts to become insignificant because yes. we start focusing on those interactions and that feeling that we have uh, as we're putting in the work. And by the way, 80% of people okay, that get the results, that reach their goal, end up giving it all back. 80% of them. If they're in love with just the goal. The 20% yes. of them that figure out have something all in common. This is it right yes, here. Yes. It's the journey. This is the this is the piece is they they've learned to make that switch or else it's almost inevitable that you're eventually going to give it back. You're going to put the weight back on, you're going to lose the strength. Those things are going to happen if that's all you are focused on. The people that are successful in this, they have figured out, and maybe they haven't figured out to attach it to all these things we're talking about. They've learned to latch on to other aspects other than their belly fat or their muscle strength or their PR inside the gym. They've learned to attach it to other aspects that enhances their life, and that's what keeps them going on and staying out of the 80% that go back. Yeah, 100%. Look, who's going to be more consistent for the rest of their life? The the man that loves exercise, that man that loves to eat healthy, or the man that loves to add 50 pounds to his bench press and lose 4% body fat, right? The person that enjoys the process and the journey goes a lot further. And if you stick to this long enough, you learn to enjoy the journey because it's the only way to do this uh, for a long period of time. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. 
We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can only find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. 